Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, we'll go ahead and, and uh, get started here. Um, I think everybody um, probably knows each other, but just in case, we'll, we'll do some quick introductions. Um, uh, I'm David Wicks, Director of Instructional Technology, and uh, uh, this is a learning community. We had a group of five of us came together to uh, study about active learning and learning spaces in association with the, uh, some of the new classrooms that have uh, been added to campus and uh, did some research on those topics. And so to be a member of the community, uh, it was an application process and uh, each person as part of that application uh, uh, answered three questions. Uh, one of the questions was, uh, why do you want to participate uh, in this community? Uh, a second one is, is how could you contribute uh, to the community? And the third was, um, what is a question you have about this type of learning? And I'm not sure anyone remembers what, what the answer to those three <laughs> questions, but their answers were good enough because they, they were selected to be part of the community. And so I'll um, uh, turn it, I'm just gonna uh, have each person introduce themselves. I'll, I'll, Kim will go next. I'm Kim Sars and I'm from accounting. Reading Copeland Family and Consumer Sciences. Narad's on Vulunu Education. And Lane Zealand in the Physics Department. And I should just say that, that just so you all know, this act you're about to see headlined in Vegas, so. <laughs> <laughs> oh, all right. <laughs> but sort of. What happened is this going to stay this? Yeah, so, <laughs> since, since we're a small enough group, uh, let's continue with Mike and just maybe quickly say uh, uh, who you are, what department, and whether or not you've taught in an active learning classroom, or if you are if you have plans to do to teach in one in the future. Uh, Mike Langford is teaching theology, and uh, I am teaching in an active learning classroom right now for the second and third time. I'm Eleanor Brzezinski and I teach in biology and I'm teaching in an active learning room and I'm teaching the same course in a lecture theatre. So I've got a lot of data that I'm probably going to analyse. I think it's been really interesting teaching the same course in two different places. You're just next door to me in the mornings, I see you. We've been in uh, Cremona in the mornings and then I teach it a couple of hours later because it's been very, very different. Um, the grades have been different as well. Yeah. 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 Uh, Cynthia Strong, librarian for education and business. I see my peeps here. Oh, yeah. See you. <laughs> I have taught one-shot sessions a number of times in Carmona. And uh, I guess this is the library classroom? Yeah, it would count. As yeah, I've done a couple sessions here. Kristen Hoffman, and I'm the librarian for psychology and scholarly communications. And I've also taught in our library classroom. I'm hoping to do more active learning in the future. Ruth Edgar, in political science and geography. And I have been teaching in the active learning classroom since they gave them to us. So, um, but not always. So it depends on the class. Janice Lee, ITS, and I use the library classroom quite a bit. Uh, Thane Erickson in psychology, and I've taught the stats class a couple times in the active learning classroom. I've kind of enjoyed that. And, uh, I haven't yet tried the active learning bathroom, but I've heard that's going to be good too. Oh, no! Active learning bathroom. I have a lot of information in those classes. Yeah, it's interesting. <laughs> active learning bathroom. I thought you could already yeah, write a wall to the bathroom. <laughs> Yeah, the bathrooms already are active learning. <laughs> yeah, they have a lot of information. <laughs> they call it store talk. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so I'm sure all of you have your own personal definition of active learning, but I came up with my own to enlighten you. So active learning is when the professor gives us some control over being the primary conduit of content analysis. By flipping the classroom learning dynamic, the professor lectures less, provides course content outside of class time, and uses the class period to employ student-centric engagement. Activities such as peer share student-led discussions and activities, and collaborative student projects. So hopefully that falls in line with what you do in the academic classroom. 
So when we got together, first thing we want to talk about is the motivation for what we're doing for this particular study. And our motivation was the recognition that what happens in the classroom is very uh, complex and dynamic. You've got the instructor, what they bring, and their behaviors, beliefs and behaviors. You've got the students, whatever they bring, and their engagement and learning styles. You have the space itself. You have technology. So how space and technology influences behavior, both instructor and uh, students, is a relatively new area of research. So we wanted to add to that. But not only that, as, as you probably see here at the university, we have a lot of options in terms of technology. It's always this new stuff coming at us, and a lot of proposals for new types of space. So we thought it was really important to understand what these relationships are. And finally, higher education in general is facing a lot of criticism and scrutiny. Uh, what's our value proposition? How do, do we deliver content? What's our funding source? Is this model sustainable? So we felt that understanding the relationship between space, technology, behavior, both instructor and student, engagement and learning is even more important. So at, at this time, it's, it's important to point out that uh, our study only included uh, faculty uh, in terms of who we surveyed. Um, we did not, uh, we intentionally weren't surveying students at this particular time, and so uh, the only uh, piece of evidence that we have uh, for the, the student's voice uh, is a tweet here uh, where a, a father of a student shared that uh, his daughter was excited about learning uh, in the active learning space. So what did we do? When we got together as a learning community, we started reading on uh, as much literature as we could on active learning spaces. And what we found is that uh, the type of learning space can influence learning outcomes. I think you mentioned that grades were different, so. Well, what could do the analysis? Because I want to make sure the two groups match. But yes. I'm some, at the end of the quarter, so. So um, it'll be interesting to see. I'll make sure they're both the same kind of cohort in both classes. So I, I don't want to jump the gun, but certainly the grades are higher in my active learning room. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, some of the studies have shown that when you control for all those other variables, some of the, the uh, learning outcomes were higher in active learning classrooms than in traditional classrooms. Uh, creative thinking was higher. Uh, student engagement, self-assessed student engagement was higher. And instructor satisfaction was higher, so satisfaction with their own jobs. They were happier in the uh, active learning classrooms. And the type of space influenced instructor behavior. And so we kind of focused in on this one, the instructor behavior. So how does this influence instructor behavior? And the literature says that um, instructors tend to, in active learning classes, lecture less, consult more, and, they, uh, and there's much more discussion in those classrooms than what they saw in traditional classrooms. Now, what was interesting is this happened even when some of the researchers were trying to control the behavior of instructors. So they're trying to control the behavior by saying, don't participate more. But what they found is they walked around more, they discussed more, and so the behavior just naturally changed. Okay. So then the interesting thing was that even in this research, on average, there was more of these behaviors, but not everyone in these active learning classrooms engaged in active learning practices and strategies. So then we said, well, well why is that? What else is going on? There has to be other factors that are influenced. So we started looking at, okay, what are the other factors then that influence instructor behavior? Well, your academic discipline. I'm sure that accountants think things should happen differently than uh, biologists, right, or theologians. We think things happen differently in the classroom. And the research said that they found that. Uh, instructor beliefs and knowledge, okay, individual pedagogy, and teaching philosophy. So we moved over and thought, well, this is really interesting, this philosophy, because this is probably something that persists. Right, so from space to space, your philosophy is not going to change much. So we looked at literature related to constructivists versus traditionalists. And uh, really when we think of philosophy, it's really what do the individuals think about how learning happens, the role of the instructor, the role of the student. And, and so 
we're not putting people in these different camps. We recognize it's a continuum. So in terms of if you're more constructivist, you will be uh, uh, creation of knowledge is more along the lines of discovery. So you might participate more in experiments or problem-based learning. On the traditionalist side, probably think learning happens from transmission, from instructor to student. So given that, we came up with three questions. So the first is, how does space influence instructor behavior? Okay. The second one, how does the teaching philosophy, so that individual teaching philosophy, how did that influence instructor behavior in different types of classrooms? And the last is looking at the interaction between the two. So what happens in terms of your individual philosophy when you're in one class versus the other environment? So how do we study this? Here's our methodology. We have a mixed methodology. We've got both quantitative and qualitative. It's a one by two within subjects design where we're looking at an individual when they're in the traditional classroom and that same individual in an active learning classroom, much like what, what you're thinking of doing. We gave these instructors five surveys. The first is a simple demographic. The second is classroom utilization. So this one measured when you're in the active learning classroom, what types of strategies and activities do you utilize? And what's your perception of your student engagement? Then we asked some open-ended questions about their experience in the classroom. Uh, classroom teaching philosophy. So these were a list of questions that tried to get at the extent to which they, uh, their views were in line with the constructivist versus traditionalist along that continuum. And the last was a survey similar to the second survey, exactly the same as the second survey. But we're asking, well, what were your activities and strategies when you were in the traditional classroom? What's your assessment of student engagement when you were in that classroom? And we could ask you whether you took the surveys, but it'd probably be a higher read. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, so, um, um, okay. Mm -hmm. So we'll just summarize the results for you. If you want more details, always talk more. Did you do the statistics? No, um, that was Ray Dean did the stats. Oh. <laughs> oh, she loves quantitative stuff. <laughs> So those three questions, um, the first one was looking at the physical learning space and how it might influence the instructor's behavior. And summary of those results showed that they, uh, if in the active learning classroom, the instructor tended to use more active learning strategies, which is you know, kind of, yeah. So we looked at uh, 32 strategies that, uh, if you answered the survey, you know that. If you didn't, now you do. We had 32 activities that you uh, responded to on a like and like type scale. And on all 32 in the active learning classroom, the teacher tended to use more of those activities than in the traditional classroom. There was also greater use of student activities in the active learning classroom and less use of lecture. So these are the things that were statistically significant. So I analyzed the qualitative data, and <laughs> yeah, okay. So the first, um, <laughs> how did the classroom influence your behavior and all your instructional practices? And these are some of the responses that were kind of like a common theme in regards to this topic. So you see that this professor, I kind of bold and highlighted ones that are important. Said, you know, he or she incorporated group learning, um, got the students into group and gave them some identity which has been proven to be really useful in active learning in classrooms they feel, you know, bought into their groups and so forth. Um, this professor also altered daily classroom agenda by making lectures more interactive and then allowing for group discussions and the rest of the class, right? So through small group discussions. Another professor kind of echoed some of that, you know, the same small working groups with students. Uh, and this professor, I guess, felt like he or she intentionally like worked on adding small group activities and um, used the seating arrangements, which is kind of like, I mean, they have to, and the whiteboard walls every class. 
So I gave an alternative view just to show that not all professors felt like, okay, you know, I went to here and I just transformed into a superhero. Um, so this professor said, oh, you know, I mean, it didn't really change much. But I did identify that the professor still said that, you know, he or she liked to be advantage, you know, the utility from having the walls to write on the circular tables and the technology access. So that is that. Okay, some more. Um, okay, so I say that. Okay, so this other professor echoed some of that wrote on the board all over the classroom. However, this is a new one. The professor felt he or she roamed more in the active learning classroom, right? Because hopefully that will, you know, foster that type of movement and have more small group discussions. And um, this professor said, well, he or she had to change the way that um, they prepare for class. And what else? And had to structure content in a way so students were more engaged working together independently. Okay, um, what else? What else? Content on was provided. Okay, right. And that would be something that is characteristic of active learning classrooms. The idea that you kind of have to give the students the content outside of class so they spend more time working together in groups in, again, during class time. So the alternative view. Um, didn't change must use many of the same practices um, in both styles of classroom um, because this professor tended to experiment with um, altern alternative instructional practices anyways, moving furniture around and so forth. So it just kind of shows that um, on average, most of the responses show that professors felt like, okay, you know, because I was in this environment, I had to do something different, but then there are professors that maybe had more of that approach than kind a of teacher in a traditional classroom. So, so the second uh, question, if you remember those three questions that we were looking at, was to do with the impact of the instructor's teaching philosophy and their behavior within the different settings. So um, what we found in analyzing the data was that there was a relationship, there was an impact on uh, the use of the classroom, depending on your philosophy. In the active learning classroom, the philosophy was more consistent with active um, learning, with the cons what we're calling the constructivist approach. And keeping in mind that we're not labeling somebody constructivist, but that their practice is more consistent with the constructivist approach. So in the learning, in the active learning classroom, that was more evident. You could see that. And in both spaces, what we did is we uh, used the median to divide people into two groups, those that were more constructivist and those that were less constructivist. And we found that in both spaces, those that we labeled more constructivist lectured less and used more active learning strategies. So it didn't matter what room they were in, they just did that. In the traditional space, the ones that were more constructivist tended to use less, or wait, no, more faculty-led activities. And as they moved from one room to the next, there was greater change um, with, if you had a more constructivist approach, you tended to change more your practice as you move from one room to the next. But the student activities didn't really change regardless of what room you're in, the instructors use those to the same extent regardless of their philosophy. Does that make sense? I said that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> it makes sense. Okay, so now we want to engage you and ask you some questions because we know you want to share. Um, so the first question we have, what are some creative things that you've done in the active learning classrooms? And I want to write, so I guess I need a lot of responses. Well, um, actually, actually uh, no, not right we didn't discuss this beforehand, but we have three whiteboards, so each table gets to answer these great. these four questions. Um, so sorry. we can do that. So you can each table, our table. Can we have a ceiling the walls if you want? Uh, yeah. <laughs> as long as you can. Only in the bathroom. Okay, so. <laughs> so this one and this one. And then this one. You're in our group. That's all right. Okay. Okay, wait, I can. Okay, colleagues. Um, attention front. Wait. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna go through our findings or discussions. 
So for the first one, what are some creative things that you've done in the active learning classrooms? I guess each group can share maybe one point. So we can keep moving. So we'd start with your group. All right. Since you wrote, I'll, I'll talk. Yes. Um, one of the things that when we're talking about like something you could do, uh, just really having folks, students, write their answers on the wall, having students compare, looking across the room, oh, that, who, who has what answer? Being able to say, okay, why is, why is that answer? Only, and I am in my class, vote. Okay, everybody vote on the answers. Why did that one receive more votes than this one? What, what, what's going on here? So in an active voting classroom, you have them just, you know, you can see student work and display it through the whole group versus I'm just telling them, this is the best answer, go for this. Now they can see, well, why is this one weaker than that one? And they can actually start to see some of these some of these strengths and weaknesses. Okay, excellent. Well, ours was, was similar in that writing on the walls and having them work out problems and demonstrate solutions and, and debate. So see what they have, um, make sense of what they have, and then debate amongst themselves. So very close to that. Okay, cool. So I don't know who from our group. You want it to go? Yeah, I and mean, I think we said the same thing. Writing on the walls, I know for me, just as a teacher, just seeing where their, their starting point is and knowing that there are some gaps in the knowledge that they wouldn't reveal to me openly and think, oh, okay, I'm going to have to start maybe a step ahead of <laughs> where I thought I was going to start. Um, and I found that just so interesting. And because I'm teaching the same class in the lecture theatre, I never have had that experience in my lecture theatre group. Yeah. I feel like I just don't know them as well. And that was the other thing we were talking about was that. Now we're at the end of quarter, and all the people who are coming to my office hours are all from my active learning group, mm -hmm. and they are not from my lecture theatre. I have 60 students in lecture theatre, I have 50 in the active learning group, and the ones who always come are the ones who I think they just feel like they know me better, or there's less, you know, whereas I'm in this big lecture theatre. So, so I think it's, it's interesting. So the relationship, I think, is much closer between the students and between them and me. So it's, um, it's been really interesting. Um, yeah. Oh, and I wanted to mention, I think this is good. Lee said that he does a kind of fishbowl exercise, which I try to do in a regular classroom. It didn't work that well. Um, so it would work really well, you know, in that kind of classroom, because the fishbowl is, you know, you give them an assignment, a circular, like one group discusses and everyone stands around the table. So it's really perfect for that. So that's a good idea. Yeah. Okay, so number two, what are some things you wish you could do? in that classroom. So, I guess how about you go? I'll be spontaneous. Yeah, good one. You're talking about the wire, it'd be nice to have the more mm -hmm. actual inputs you made. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, so we, we um, <laughs> mentioned that uh, if we didn't have to connect mm -hmm. to the, com the computers of, around, they get used more, the screens would get used more mm -hmm. if people didn't have to connect. Mm -hmm. And one big way to do that would be to use uh, a wireless uh, projector mm -hmm. so that you you could have it so people could both write on a um, interactive whiteboard mm -hmm. um, because we also all discussed um, being less excited about the walls as they're getting darker and darker we do too but it's really yeah, hard to clean them me. so that, that's actually that's a really good idea. Yeah, um, glass you can clean with glass cleaner. And I have to say that just because I know that there's money tight, I would love in my horrible, miserable room that I teach, I lecture theatre, I would love to have whiteboards in there and light, uh -huh. rather than you guys light. spend a lot of money on a fancy, fancy wireless connection. And I know that you know I don't mean to be rude with giving that. It seems <laughs> that that would mean that I can engage 60 students as opposed to this lucky few who yep. get to be in a fancy. Well, we were theater. actually installing six projectors yeah. in the classroom, so you know what I'm saying. It's it's expensive. I think in terms of choice of the money, I do get the, yeah, white, yeah, yeah. the walls putting glass up instead of a whiteboard. Or would be a much better investment of money than expensive high tech stuff. Seriously. And, and my wife's work just like today or tomorrow, mm. they're installing. Uh, they they looked at putting whiteboards up, mm. um, and they said that they could do it cheaper with the glass. Yeah. That's mm. kind of a um, yeah. I don't know what you, the smoke glass or yeah. um, and 
So it, it, well, it would clean easier. Yeah, it would we, definitely clean easier. Yeah. I don't know what the downside of it is, but well, that's a great idea. Like, the acoustics might be slightly different. <laughs> well, it, that would be okay. And a follow-on to that is, I mean, one of the things we've done in physics for a long time is just go to Home Depot, get a 4x8 sheet of, of shower board, cut it up into six pieces, and, and have those. And, and I mean, those, we have probably, you know, uh, 50 of these, you know, three foot by two foot uh, whiteboards that that even when I'm working in a room that has the whiteboards on the walls and has the whiteboard on the table, I'm s I still have to have those because mm -hmm. because I've got to erase the whiteboard on the wall mm -hmm. and I've got to erase the whiteboard on the what table the for another class. It's just whiteboard, but it's just cheap whiteboard. That you, How do you, what do you do with it? You just put it on the table, and then the students no, put mean, it up in the chalk drawer. You throw it away, or? oh, I mean, eventually they go bad, but oh. but you, it's not corrugated at all, like the textured, like the wall surface. So mm -hmm. because of that, it, it cleans mm -hmm. for a longer mm -hmm. period of time better. Mm -hmm. But but, mm -hmm. um, but that's I guess for me that's one of the pieces of what I would like. What, what I wish I could do is I think sometimes it's hard to it's hard to hold to to, to have that artifact of the classroom work and carry that artifact forward to the next class session. Um, I mean, you can, you, can, you can certainly, you know, take pictures of all the whiteboard surfaces, but somehow it's not the same as, as what you had when, you, when the class ended the, the time before. Okay, so you want to share what you wish you could have done? Um, well, we were basically thinking of just new ways and new ideas. <coughs> 32 that you mentioned in your research. Yeah, we'd love to have a, a list of the 32. That 32 would be lovely to have. Mm -hmm. So yeah. we can expand our toolbox. Mm -hmm. If you could pass that back out to us, that'd be great. Yeah. I mean, just to even, I mean, I know some of it was discipline specific we were talking about, but also I know my discipline is very lecture oriented. And, and so just even inventing ways, trying to figure out ways. There's a lot of simu political science. There's a lot. If it's not going to be doing lecture, it's doing simulations that require lots and lots of. Okay, I'm going to reconstruct the entire classroom. I'm going to be the Arab League, but it's all this lead up time that I've got to do. Whereas there's got to be something in the middle of all that. That's, so even just knowing, we, yeah, we agreed. With your list of 32 activities, we'd love to have that. Yeah. I think one thing that I've done at the end of classes is trying to get them to do like concept maps. And what's been really interesting is the direction of the arrows. That's been really interesting. So they put, like, give them a whole bunch of words to link. And it's just so intriguing having thought that I have, you know, we've gone, we've gone through this, but this would lead to that. And you're thinking, what? what so that's really interesting. They're able to try and link these things. So again, maybe a progression of political ideas or progression of, I don't know what you guys teach. But do you know what I'm saying? So that ordering of those ideas, you know, having got that sort of logical thinking process. So concept mapping has been very, very interesting. Um, people putting things in very bizarre orders and thinking, oh, that's interesting. Well, then why do we put it that way around? And someone else doing something different over there. Oh, how intriguing. Yeah, again, the difference. But concept mapping has been very interesting. Ooh. Okay, so now we go to number three. What mistakes did you make? And I guess we can start with my group. Um, well, I only got the one from our discussion, and that's kind of like the idea of trying to use the technology and realizing that it took up a lot of time and did not increase the utility or increase the maybe the quality of discussion or whatever. So that was one of the things that came up. So it was just kind of easier to write on the board and just keep it moving. Okay, so um, group two, you want to share? Like, yeah, I think number three? we would also, you know, yeah, um, concur with that. That sometimes the, you know, the, the up, you know, getting getting everything ready. But we're saying, you know, it's easy to slip back into the lecturing because it's, it's the old way of doing things. I can the deliver default. this. It's default. Um, you know, you have to keep turning around while you're doing it. I'm yeah. just saying, like an in, active in learning classroom, yeah. mm -hmm. it's, yeah. it doesn't, it's built yeah. up. Right. <laughs> and then there's also some time, and, and because you guys are do one lecture, I, you know, the, that was, these were more limitations of just the way you guys are teaching. You come in, you have one lecture, this is all you get, you get five minutes. And this kind of, this has taken time. Mm -hmm. And that's all. The, yeah, we can't do an active learning in a one-shot library information, information literacy session. Mm -hmm. So we're 10 minutes. 
very short. So then the <laughs> students don't really understand how to use. So I think find resources, use them, and then yeah. And even in a tra traditional classroom, I mean, figuring out how I've got to cover these five things. Right. But if I spend, you know, thirty minutes on an active learning thing that only covers one, then I got to lecture like a, a, you know, machine gun through the rest. <laughs> and, you know, just kind of have no shot that machine gun lecture. It's like there you go. So we spend. I mean, so again, we're back to the timing. Ours were um, similar is that um, one of us said that when um, did a flipped classroom we found out that we really created a class and a half because uh, of the yeah, content issue yeah and um, the then the flip side of that is when we're in the active learning classrooms we're dependent on the students coming prepared mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, yeah. how do you make sure that you and, do and yes. it's clear that some some do not, even exactly. though they're in that environment and they yeah. know that they're going to be on, they're going to be on, they still don't do it. And so how um, that was, and, and then you, and that leads to, oh, I better pick it up and lecture, yeah. right? Because yeah. they're not, they're not stepping yeah. up. And um, so those were the, uh, some of our mistakes. Excellent findings. Okay, so um, number four, what limitations did you face? Um, yeah, group. Oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> um, again, just the discipline. I mean, it's, it's one of the, I think, trying to figure out how to think of the discipline differently. In political science, trying to figure out, I normally lecture, one of the big key concepts in comparative political systems is, um, you know, the single member district <coughs> plurality or first past the post, which we have here, versus single member district majority versus proportional representation. I usually just lecture on that. But if I can figure out a way, and I did, to turn it into, okay, but it takes a lot of time. Once initially, okay, here's three districts. Well, what is the Congress made of in this, if this is the electoral scheme, if this is the electoral scheme, if this is the electoral, okay, who has, and then have them write them all. But, I mean, delivering that by lecture, you know, they're scribbling away and it's 10 minutes later. Um, so I'm trying to figure out how many more concepts go with that. Because mm -hmm. like, my discipline isn't geared for this at this point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Number four. What limitations that you face? Is that heat, sand? Sound. Sound. So at the end of the day, um, last, on Wednesday, I guess that was yesterday, um, some of my students were talking about the active learning classroom and they, and a lot of the complaints were they're really hot yeah. in Cremona. Um, the, when the air conditioning goes on, nobody can hear anybody else. And if I'm talking, I'm, I realize I'm yelling when it goes off. <laughs> yeah. And that when we're sharing as a classroom, it's difficult for groups to communicate with each other. So we felt those were limiting. Uh, those, so I wrote those down. But I think this is um, the last one was uh, related to what we've been talking about is how do you effectively flip your classroom um, when, when, you, when you have such content rich. Uh, like I'm an accountant, we have a CPA exam at the end. Uh, they have to have content, right? Um, and so how, how, do you, you, how do you do that? Um, you bring up a really interesting point, and I have. Um, I noticed that the students' hearing is much better than mine. So what? I, <laughs> so I'll have a student in one side of the room who's speaking yes. so softly, yes. and I'm thinking, I can't hear that student above the air conditioning. But I said, can you people hear her or him? And they usually can, but there's a couple that I just, nobody can hear these people. And I try to get them to speak up, we can't hear you, you know. It just, so I think that that is an issue. And temperature, Bertona too. Not only are those whiteboards not erasable, except using special spray cleaner, which we have to do here. Mm -hmm. The the temperature goes from cold to downright frigid. Mm -hmm. So I have a student right next to the thing pushing the button. <laughs> and it's like okay. Harder <laughs> couldn't fall asleep. Oh. There you go. <laughs> okay, so I'll just quickly close up and just quickly go three points. Um. So what our group discussed is. 
Lane shared his interesting story of maybe underestimating, I don't know if that's a fair way, the power of like bodies, because he had them do an exercise where, you know, he said, okay, you go on this side, you go on that side, and he said it really created a lot of like division and angst when people felt like they didn't fit into the groups, whereas if they just raised their hands, it would have been less. I was like, playing a lot with having students move a lot during uh -huh. class. And, I mean, one of the things that, that I, I was thinking about with what Kim said, the sort of difficulty being heard um, at one side of the room, and one of, I mean, the, there are pluses and minuses to everything, but one of the things that we do a lot in, in, in one of my classes is all sort of you know, encourage people to come and gather around one table and then let that, let that sort of segue into a group discussion. So first, the reason we're gathering around the table is because there's something that the group has written on that table that, that they want, that, that I want everybody to sort of attend to and, 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 and think about. Um, but then we let that spill over into a, or segue into a group discussion and now you've got a group discussion where no one's farther than like 20 feet away from anyone else. Mm -hmm. Now half of them are standing. Um, they don't have their notes mm -hmm. to, to write down you know, when that's happening. But, but I just find that those sort of, um, those coalesced, sort of spontaneously coalesced group discussions tend to be a lot more um, uh, sort of spatially uh, conducive than, than when everyone is, is in their selective seats and, um, and people have their backs to other people and, yeah. and that sort of thing. That's probably the biggest drawback is when um, you're sitting in the pods and students constantly have their back to everyone else yeah. Yeah. because of where they're sitting. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. They move back to the front of the class at all. What's and the, even though they could move, they just don't. What's mm -hmm. the lack of expertise? Oh, well, I put that. I just, I personally feel like I have a lack of expertise with the technology. So the classroom side felt like maybe if I could just get trained on it, it would be even easier. Like, because you can train students to come in, be like, okay, for this class, you have to come five minutes early, set up your laptops and stuff. But, I mean, I'm not even confident to have them troubleshoot, so I don't even go by it. So, let me, <laughs> I'm just saying for me, maybe, if, you know, when I get more comfortable in it, maybe I can have it extremely, but I have expertise. Okay, so, it's <coughs> all for successful your turn. Okay. Yeah, we've got a lot of content to cover here, so if we can keep the active learning down. <laughs> 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 I know, class. I did this as an object lesson, but I, you always have to assume that things will go more slowly than, than, than you thought. So, okay, so where are we? So we are on question number three. Okay, let's keep. So this question was looking at the philosophy, the teaching philosophy and the learning space and how they interact to influence what the teacher does and also the uh, perception of student engagement. And the instructors that in the uh, active learning space, they perceive students to be more engaged. They tended to uh, perceive students to be more engaged. And those that were more constructivist on that spectrum, they tended to perceive students as more engaged in the um, active learning classroom. And there was, so there was a correlation between the teaching philosophy and perceptions of student engagement in, in the um, active learning classroom. In the traditional classroom, there didn't seem to be any sort of relationship between their perceptions and their philosophy, which was kind of interesting. Oh. Right, so yeah, so, so kind of the, my take home from that point was, I mean, in student engagement, I think, is, is, is definitely in the eye of the beholder here, right? Because what we're talking about is faculty perceptions of student engagement. And so I think it's really hard to say anything about, um, about how each individual faculty person benchmark their, their perceptions of student engagement. But because of that, one of the things that jumped out to us was that the, the more, the, the fact that we identified as more constructivist tended to see a bigger increase in student engagement when they moved from a traditional space to an active learning space. And so our question was, why is it 
that, um, I mean, the, 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 the data said that, that there was a bigger shift among those, those uh, faculty we, we, we characterize as more constructivists. Um, and, and then our question was why? What, what is it about those, about those faculty that, that um, allowed them to, uh, to, to observe or to facilitate a, a bigger engagement, a bigger change in engagement as they move from the traditional space to the academic space? And one, one idea um, that, that sort of uh, came out of the short answer response was that there was a kind of widespread perceptions among among a lot of the faculty that uh, that there was a loss of faculty control in the in the active learning classroom that that showed up in a lot of different forms, but it seemed to be a fairly consistent message. Um, but one of when we when, it, when we sort of looked at those the the ways in which faculty identified that loss of faculty control and in, and and sort of a, a, a a corresponding increase of student control. Um, sometimes it was described in a very positive light, and sometimes it was described in a very negative light. And so, just you know, to give some examples of you know a more negative light, uh, you know, people talking about um, not being able to keep contact with the students uh, um, without walking around, um, or feeling like they had to be had a shot to be heard, um, or difficult to control side conversations. But then, very similar, you know, possibly very similar behavior among the students was also sometimes characterized in a positive light. Um, so okay. the activities changed as we went along, uh, both directed by me and invented by the students. So the students are coming in and changing what's happening in the classroom. Um, or, uh, or I, I really like this this last piece, which the faculty person saying that they felt like the classroom seemed to increase um, the trust in each other's intelligence. Uh, and, and so, so one hypothesis, which we haven't really uh, tested yet, is that somehow um, it's important in order to kind of reap the benefits of the active learning classroom, um, it's important to, uh, see, to, to see that, that loss of control, that giving over of control to the students, um, and see the positive pieces that can come out of that giving over of control. Um, so that, that, was, uh, that was one of our... Uh, Take home thoughts.